In this lesson, we'll show how the Neiman Pearson criterion for maximizing the detection probability for a fixed false alarm probability leads to the likelihood ratio test, and we'll show how to construct receiver operating characteristic curves for a couple of examples. Well, the general hypothesis testing problem involves data that are governed by one of two statistical models, and based on those models, we'd like to construct some sort of decision rule for classifying the data into one of the two models. In general, we do that by partitioning the observation space into two regions. One we might call x1, the other x0, and x1 is the region that classifies data into hypothesis 1. Now based on that region, we can define the detection probability as the probability that data from hypothesis 1 are in the region, and the false alarm probability as the probability that data from hypothesis 0 are in that region. Ideally, we'd like for the detection probability to be large and the false alarm probability to be small. We could, of course, make the detection probability 1 by setting the detection region to the entire observation space. That would, however, also make the false alarm probability 1. Instead, we'd like to make the detection probability as large as possible while holding the false alarm probability to some fixed value. Well, specifically then, we'd say we'd like to pick a classification region that maximizes the detection probability subject to the constraint that the false alarm probability is some fixed value, say alpha. To do this, we can use a straightforward application of Lagrange multipliers. That is, we augment this detection probability with a term that has the false alarm probability minus the specified value alpha multiplied by a parameter gamma. When the false alarm probability is equal to gamma, this term will be zero and we'll be maximizing the detection probability as we initially intended. Now this augmented objective function has two terms that depend on the classification region, the detection probability and the false alarm probability, which we could show the specific dependence through the integrals that define those probabilities. Then if we group the terms in a common interval, we can use the same logic that we used when we derived Bayes' test. That is, if we want to maximize this objective, then we should include only the positive terms in the integral. That means that the classification region should be the places where the density under hypothesis 1 minus this multiplying parameter times the density under hypothesis 0 is greater than 0. And that means that we classify the data as hypothesis 1 when the likelihood ratio exceeds some threshold gamma. Well, the value of that threshold should be chosen so that we attain the desired false alarm probability. As an example, let's look at a situation where the observation is an exponential random variable for each hypothesis, but the means are mu0 for hypothesis 0 and mu1 for hypothesis 1. Those densities might look like this for the situation when mu1 is greater than mu0. Now because the data are in the exponent of the densities, the log likelihood ratio will allow us to get a more compact result for the decision rule. And this has two terms, one of which involves the data and one of which does not. Now the log likelihood ratio test could be written in this form, but the constant term, the logarithm of mu0 over mu1, could be subtracted from both sides without changing the inequalities. And here we've absorbed that term into the threshold variable gamma. Furthermore, if mu1 is greater than mu0, then we can divide by the multiplicative term without changing the inequalities. Of course, if mu1 is less than mu0, we'd have to reverse the inequalities when we divided by this term on both sides. Well, let's look at the situation where mu1 is greater than mu0, so the rule would reduce to a simple comparison of the data with a threshold. And from this test, we could define the false alarm and detection probabilities. Well, the false alarm probability would be the integral of the density for hypothesis 0 from the threshold to infinity. We could write that in terms of the cumulative distribution function under hypothesis 0 which for the exponential turns out to be 1 minus e to the negative gamma threshold divided by the appropriate mean. And that would result in a final result that says the false alarm probability is e to the negative gamma, the threshold, divided by the mean for hypothesis 0.
Likewise, the detection probability would be very similar and it would result in a term that now depended on the mean under hypothesis one and the threshold. Now to construct the receiver operating characteristic plot, which would be a plot of the detection probability versus the false alarm probability, we could let gamma range from zero to some sufficiently large value, determine the false alarm and detections that go for each of those gammas, and then plot them. In this case, though, we can easily solve for the threshold that produces a specific false alarm probability, and we can use that to get a detection probability as a function of the false alarm probability. So it turns out the detection probability is the false alarm probability raised to the power of mu0 over mu1, which is the ratio of the mean in hypothesis 0 and the mean for hypothesis 1. Well, using that equation, we could make this receiver operating characteristic plot. And this particular figure, for example, shows the plots for various ratios of the means. Note that when the means are equal, we won't be able to distinguish between the two hypotheses, and the ROC curve corresponds to the straight line we would associate with making random, uninformed guesses. As we get more separation between the means, we get better and better receiver operating characteristic curves. Now as another example, let's look at the situation where hypothesis zero corresponds to data with a zero mean Laplacian distribution, and hypothesis one corresponds to data that have zero mean Gaussian distribution, and in both situations, the standard deviations are the same. Now the densities would look something like this, where the red is for hypothesis zero, the Laplacian, and the blue is the Gaussian density for hypothesis one. And we could see that these densities on both sides, they cross at two places. And those places are proportional to the standard deviation. Now because of these two crossings, we might expect the classification regions to be a little more complicated than in our previous example. Well, the log likelihood ratio contains terms that depend on the data and other terms that do not, and those terms can ultimately be absorbed into the threshold. And that'll result in, the, in this form for our decision rule. Now to simplify this a bit, we could multiply both sides by two times sigma squared, which would then have this form. And again, we've absorbed the positive term we multiplied into the threshold. Now, if we'd like to, we could also multiply both sides by negative one, but this will cause us to reverse the inequalities for the decisions. The term on the left then prescribes the way we'll need to process the data for our decision rule. Because it, is in, because it involves x squared and the absolute value of x, we can think of the decision rule as a function of the absolute value of the observation. Well here for instance is a plot of the left hand side as a function of the absolute value for x. The value this function attains at its minimum is negative 2 times sigma squared and the place where it crosses back above zero is two times the square root of two times sigma. Now because of this shape, any value for the threshold that's smaller than negative two times sigma squared will classify all of the data, any place the data could take its values as hypothesis zero. Then when the threshold is between negative two times sigma squared and zero, we'll have a region where we'll classify as hypothesis one, and a region around that where we still classify as hypothesis zero. That region that we classify as hypothesis one will expand as we grow the threshold toward zero. And then when the threshold is equal to zero, the region will be from zero to two times the square root of two times sigma. Then the region for H1 that we classify as hypothesis one, that'll grow as we increase the threshold beyond that point. Now let's use this information to evaluate the false alarm probability. Now when the threshold is below negative two times sigma squared, the false alarm probability is zero because we'll always be saying H0 or hypothesis zero is true. When we're between negative two times sigma squared and zero, we'll need to integrate the density between two values for x, then multiply that 
by 2 to account for the possibility of negative values. So we'll want this area under the density for hypothesis 0, but there's two of those, again, accounting for the negative values. Now the two values are the roots of the quadratic equation that involves the left-hand side minus the threshold. Now as the threshold increases, this region will widen, and it'll continue to widen until the threshold is equal to zero. And then as we increase, we'll integrate from zero to the positive root of that quadratic equation. The other root will be negative. And of course, we'll multiply two by two to account for both sides. And that'll give us all the values for larger and larger values of the threshold. Then we could follow the exact same process for the detection probability. We'd begin with zero for small thresholds, increase in the same way, but this time the interval will be relative to the Gaussian density instead of the two-sided exponential. And we'll continue as the threshold grows. Ultimately, the lower limit of the integral will convert to zero. And we can do that for all values of the threshold. Now to get the receiver operating characteristic for this situation, we could use MATLAB in the following code. Of course, you could use some other language, but the process would be essentially the same. Well, here I begin by defining the function for the defining functions for the two cumulative distributions. F0 would be the cumulative distribution for the two-sided exponential or Laplacian. F1 is the cumulative distribution function for the Gaussian, which involves an error function. Then I'd compute the roots for the quadratic equation, which are both positive when the threshold is negative. And once the threshold is positive, one of the roots will be negative, so I'll replace that one by zero. Finally, I can use the cumulative distributions to compute the desired probabilities, multiply by two, and that'll give me the data I need to plot the receiver operating characteristic. Well, it turns out that this is independent of the values for the standard deviation, so regardless of the value for sigma, we'll get this same receiver operating characteristic. And we see that distinguishing between a Gaussian and a Laplacian distribution with the same standard deviation results in a hypothesis test with a relative ba relatively bad receiver operating characteristic.